Welcome to Conversations That Count. I thank you for joining us on a weekday evening. On a we, our conventions are coming up, our primaries are coming up. So I want to make sure we are inviting as many candidates as possible in this podcast. So you get to know your candidates very well. I am Srile Kapale, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Community Engagement. As Republican Party congressional primaries are coming on, I am going to continue to focus on bringing in as many candidates as possible to this conversations that count. So we all get to know the candidates positions on issues that you and I care about. At Fairfax GOP, we are deeply committed to engaging all of you during this congressional primary process. So that being said, if you have any questions for our upcoming candidates, uh, you can feel free to post on Facebook live chat. So I get to all of them and I'll definitely try to ask our candidate and get their answers for you. Today's candidate is John Henley. John is a veteran parent and a conservative running for Congressional District 10. He has been serving his country his entire adult life. John started out as an enlisted aircraft maintenance technician in the Air Force during Desert Storm. When he was fully commissioned into the Air Force, he was assigned to the Space Operations Carrier Field. He served in multiple roles, including operations officer and commander, the Joint Staff and the Office of Air Force Le Legislative Liaison, where he helped lead the vision for a sixth branch of America's Armed Forces, the Space Force. In 2019, John retired from the Air Force and has continued to serve in national security, working on classified programs and advising on national security matters. John has five children and two of them are actually currently serving on active duty in the Air Force. John holds graduate degrees from Trident University, National Intelligence University, the Eisenhower School for National Security and Resource Policy, and was in fact 2015 MIT Seminar Fellow. He's running to represent our proud 10th district. As you can hear from his bio, John is very accomplished. John, welcome to Conversations That Count. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the conversation and some great questions. A couple more days to the primary and we're running hard. Awesome. John, you retired just three years back and uh, you could have easily just taken a break, chilled and rested. Why did you decide to get into politics? <laughs> well, I've always had a, uh, I've always had a passion to serve uh, and seeing what's, you know, what's transpired over the last year within our country, uh, whether it be inflation, whether it be national security issues, uh, whether it be border security, uh, you know, I had a choice to make. I can either, you know, yell at the TV and, and, uh, uh, or I could put a target on my back uh, and through faith step forward, and we chose the latter. Uh, my wife and I have, have been out on the campaign trail together. Uh, we've met a lot of great people. Uh, we've met, you know, even some of our fellow candidates uh, and, and their families, and uh, and and that's what we're going to do. So we're going to we're going to continue to run this race that uh, we've been called to to run, and uh, it'll culminate on Saturday with hopefully a primary victory and a general election. Uh, strategy that will defeat Jennifer Wexton. Awesome. Uh, so John, looks like you owned a small uh, agricultural business and I'll tell you why I'm focused on that. <laughs> and you enjoy time on the farm with your animals and gardening and living the dream. So, uh, so what I really liked with uh, the answer that you gave is when I asked about why political life, you didn't go on and on of why politics are important. You started off saying you wanted to serve. I think uh, that's precisely what I see in the candidates. I mean, instead of living the dream, you want to serve and you got into business of politics. Thanks. Thank you for willing to take the hit for all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. So John, your opponent, I'll focus on Wexton because I always say winners focus on opponent instead of fighting amongst themselves. So let's focus on Wexton. She is actually the co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Agri, Agri Tourism Caucus. Not sure if you're familiar with that, but she is. She yep. often, I've noticed her that she often welcomes businesses from Virginia's 10th Congressional District in order to share their perspective on the impacts of agritourism on local economics. Right. And in, um, I've kind of uh, heard her spark a discussion about the importance of this as well. So I was kind of curious to know, since you're in that line of business, at least partially after you retire, what are your thoughts on agritourism as a small agricultural businessman yourself? I think, you know, traveling around the Congressional Tent uh, and talking with farmers in Fauquier County, Rappahannock, even Western Loudoun, uh, Western Prince William, uh, you know, a, a lot of 
land development has, you know, has, has stressed small farms. Uh, taxes have gone up, uh, data centers have gone up, and uh, it, it's hard to just make a living at farmers markets. So being able to, to, to you know, venture into agritourism, being able to teach people, uh, you know, how to farm, how to, how to cultivate the land, how to, how to you know, almost provide for yourself. I mean, we have a supply chain crisis, uh, you know, sometimes and with fuel and everything getting so expensive. Uh, it, 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 it's good for people to learn skills uh, like that. And if you can uh, continue making a living through agritourism, uh, uh, that, that may help buffer some of the issues we've seen uh, on the uh, agriculture side, uh, you know, then, then that's what that's what we need to uh, that's what we need to continue to do. And obviously, we've seen that with a lot of the vineyards uh, you know, in the area. Uh, uh, you know, they've a lot of them sprouted up in the past 10 years. Uh, many of them are doing very well. And I think we need to continue to support their efforts. Uh, one thing I do support is, you know, consolidating uh, an office of agritur uh, agritourism uh, within uh, the farm of ag agriculture. Uh, right now, there's like five or six different offices uh, with information all over the place. You know, it'd be nice to have one office that, that uh, someone interested in agritourism can go to uh, to get that information. Uh, so that you're not on the phone three, four hours a day and, or waiting for a call back. Uh, and one, one place you go to uh, that helps a small business owner be able to not just earn a living, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, allow us to start a new business. Absolutely, John. I think you're absolutely right. And I think one of the reason I frame the questions is because I want to kind of understand what is um, Wexton, because uh, but I, I always felt Wexton has always uh, uh, voted on party lines, really doesn't have the deep understanding on issues. So it is very, it is very refreshing to see that you're just a candidate still, um, and you have a deeper understanding of uh, the congressional issues too, and the caucuses they run. And that's the most important thing for me when I'm looking for a candidate. Does this candidate understand as much as uh, the candidate that's already out there understands? So you seem to be in par with what's going on with agritourism. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Yeah, you gotta be ready day one. Absolutely. Oh, there you go. Day one is our goal. Day one is a, like I always say, Garner Youngkin statement, day one, and he really got into, uh, I said he got his hands dirty on day one, for sure. Yep, yep. And that's what will happen uh, in Congress, provided the Republicans take over. And, and I, I'm uh, blessed enough to represent this district. You will find no harder fighter uh, and no one with the depth of experience that I have uh, to be able to help address some of these issues that are affecting us across the board. I like fighters. There you go. I love the spirit. So I, did, I, I did review your website and I enjoyed your issues. I mean, there were a couple, several issues that you picked. First, Second Amendment, you had pro-life, you had strong borders, national security, yeah. you had partnering and respecting law enforcement, education, election, integrating. I mean, all the kitchen table issues. But let me kind of focus a little bit on Second Amendment. Okay. I think coming from an immigrant background, it did take me a while to kind of get used to the concept of Second Amendment. Yeah. Uh, I, um, if, you if you look at 10th Congressional District, uh, there are a lot of immigrants and minorities that may not feel really comfortable. What would you tell those voters about Second Amendment? Although now I'm fully on board with it, I agree with it. I, I really like to hear from a congressional a candidate perspective. What would you tell those people that are really not super comfortable with that issue? Well, I would uh, first ask them, you know, why did you come to America? You know, did you come here to uh, escape oppression? Uh, you know, gains, uh, you know, did, was your safety uh, in jeopardy? Uh, if, if that's the was your government oppre you know, oppressing you know its people and its rights, uh, the nice thing about the Second Amendment is uh, it, it's the people's amendment that protects the other amendments to make sure our rights uh, are, are are protected across the board, uh, and our rights are God given; they're not given from government. Uh, you know, does that mean everyone's going to you know be like the wild wild west? No, it doesn't mean that. We're we we we've, we've matured beyond uh, the wild wild west. Uh, but what it does uh, do is it allows it allows the American people to keep a check on government so that they, they do not become tyrannical and start trampling on our rights. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is our, uh, our our government. This is our form of government, and it won't operate without uh, an educated electorate uh, who understands all the amendments and why they're there. Yeah. 
And John, I think you're absolutely right. I said, um, I think people are starting to get comfortable. I think it's important ca candidates such as you never fear from talking about Second Amendment and kind of start going at it. Uh, and I also will put religious liberty in the same basket as Second Amendment. I said it's a God-given right. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah, and we've seen, uh, you know, the government kind of trample on some of those uh, religious rights uh, with vaccine mandates. Uh, I have uh, some really close friends who worked for me when I was in the Air Force. Uh, a couple of them are pilots. Uh, they've spent 16, 17 years of their life defending this nation, and they're being, uh, they're being kicked out because of the vaccine mandate. And they wouldn't approve, the Air Force uh, or the DOD would not approve their religious exemption. Uh, even though they, they, they're, I mean, as long as I've known, they've been deep Catholics uh, or one has been a, a Muslim uh, as well. And they're just getting kicked out for, 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 for nonconformity. Uh, and we need to make sure as members of Congress, if the Republicans take over, that we pass a bill that uh, allows us to grandfather those people who are kicked out, reinstate them into the same rank, the same job with back pay so that they, you know, if, if I'm, if, if if, if my brothers and sisters in, in arms are willing to fight and die for our country and for our constitution, they need to be afforded those same constitutional rights and they're not right now. So Congress needs to take a strong stand uh, come January and make sure that they're protected as well as our healthcare workers and on and on and on. Because religious freedom is critical. Again, it's freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. Excellent, yeah, thank you, I agree. Thank you for making the distinction about religious freedom. So, uh, John, one thing that I was literally really surprised about the issues, I think you picked all the right issues for very good reason. Uh, when you're talking about strong borders and national security, do you think we need to focus a little bit on illegal immigration as well? Uh, as again, I said, I'm, I'm an immigrant and um, half of my circle, 100% um, of my circle is here legally, but half of my circle still struggles with these green card uh, citizenship, whereas when we have illegal immigrants just coming in as refugees or whatever means they come in and get the citizenship uh, in like two months, three months, when I have 50% of my friends stand in line for the last 15 years. So do you and think legal do. immigration? Yeah, uh, I, no, it, it, I don't think our immigration system is broken, as many politicians say. I think they're just too lazy to enforce the laws that have been passed by Congress. And Congress has the power of the purse, uh, and, and they can they can address these things tomorrow. Uh, you know, whether it be the Department of Homeland Security failing to secure the border, uh, you can you can fence some of their funding to kind of curb some of their behaviors. That's 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 kind of what you do with federal dollars to to make to make sure certain behaviors are encouraged and certain uh, behaviors are discouraged. Uh, and and right now we've got we have to make sure that uh, the immigrants that are coming in legally. Uh, are at the front of the line. Uh, you know, they've been, uh, you know, they've spent a lot of money uh, to, to be able to come in and it's taken years for them to get here. And it's taken years for them to try to get their citizenship as well, but they're doing it the right way. And that's, and that's the nice thing about a representative government is, uh, you know, it, it's we the people uh, who, who invite immigrants to join us uh, because that we were one nation uh, with 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 many cultures, but we're still one nation. So we've got to we've got to be able to work on uh, new legislation to make sure that the border is secure. Because without without a secure border, we don't have American sovereignty. Without American sovereignty, we don't have a country. So we've got to make sure people are doing this legally uh, and 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 making sure they have the right information uh, to be able to make those applications uh, and whatever funding is required at that time. Uh, and it's all on StateDepartment.gov. Become a citizen. There's a listing of things. So when people say it's broke, it's not. And we can limit some of the, the time frame it takes for some of our illegal immigrants to come in. And I think that's 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 worth working on. But the illegal immigrants, uh, you know, there, there's no frontline pass in my opinion. There, there's not, there, there's too many great, what I call new Americans who've come in and done it first or did it right. And they are, uh, you know, contributing to the economy. They're contributing to schools. They're volunteering to be coaches. Uh, that's, what makes, that's what makes America great. And we need to keep it that way. So, John, I think you offer a very fresh perspective. A lot of politicians say immigration system is broken. Uh, and so, and I think sometimes they say that, so they've basically given up hope on fixing it. I think real courageous candidates are the ones that would say, you know what, 
Um, I'm sure it is slightly broken, but the goal is if you enforce what is actually in the books, then yes. half of our problems will just go away overnight. So thank you for pro providing that fresh perspective. And I think more, I want more listeners to understand that our Republican candidates are for legal immigration. They will support legal immigration. They yes. also will enforce it if they come to the office. Yeah. And we have 1.2 million uh, legal immigrants that are allowed into the United States each year. And those are the those are the people that we need to make sure uh, you know are uh, you know the, the job skills are, or the job opportunities are there the educational opportunities are there uh, because they're taking a risk uh, immigrating from their country to the United States to enjoy the American dream and it, I, I think I, I think we have an obligation to make sure that uh, we welcome them with open arms. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. So, John, uh, you know, so the 10th Congressional District is, is extremely diverse from the perspective of races, ethnicity, and, not, and also has multiple counties. Who knows better as you're going through the um, Congressional District? Fairfax County, Fakia County, Loudoun County, Manassas Park. So while you're campaigning, John, or, or um, in the counting, have you noticed any differences in viewpoints on prioritization of issues? Like does Prince William County has different issues compared to Loudoun County or the issues are same no matter where you go? They have been the same. Uh, the number one issue that we have talked, regardless of the demographic, has been the economy and the inflation. Uh, and a lot of a lot of the immigrant families that we've talked to in Manassas, Manassas Park, uh, uh, even up here in Loudoun County, uh, you know, they're small business owners. Some of them are electricians. Some of them are HVAC. Uh, some of them are, are uh, uh, remodelers. Uh, you know, they they've seen the increase of of uh, you know not just gas but but materials to be able to uh, to ensure that they can finish their job. But that is obviously you know, increased costs for them. It's increased costs for uh, uh, us as consumers. Uh, the other, the second uh, issue has been education. You know, we need to get more more closer to what Martin Luther King said, where the content of your character, uh, less than Ibram e Kendi, who's the critical race theory guy, who says you're oppressed because of your race. We need more of Martin Luther King uh, in, 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 in these schools and less of Ibram Kendi. Uh, but those are those have been the the, the top two issues uh, that that I've seen across the district. It didn't matter what county we were in; those were the two main ones. Wow, wow, that's good. That's good to know. I think nationwide education has become a priority. That's one thing I said. COVID, uh, it's a blessing in disguise, right? Now we know what they teach. Yep. And, and I say the exact same thing because otherwise we wouldn't have known. And and I can give you just a quick story on on our daughter. You know, our daughter went to Brent, uh, Brentsville High School uh, uh, as, in ninth grade. And they're reading this book called The Hate You Give. It's about a little black girl uh, growing up uh, and, her, uh, and her dad is uh, part of the Black Panthers, uh, but she goes to a white school. And of course there's a, a, a shooting of a, a, of, a, of a black kid by a white cop, uh, but the story or, or the, uh, the assignment was, uh, you know, write the, ten, write the 10 tenets of Black Panthers and write two paragraphs, or pick one and write two paragraphs on how you could institute that in America today. Wow. So we're like, shut the laptop, we're done. Contacted the school, they're like, well, I don't think that's what the teacher meant. No, I think that's exactly what the teacher meant. This was AP English and she said, I have, I have uh, you, know, you know, pretty big uh, left and right limits on how I teach this. And we pulled her out of school, we homeschooled her the rest of the year. And then we put her in uh, Covenant Christian Academy uh, this past September uh, where she's at right now because we were not, we are not going to subscribe to critical race theory uh, or hate or anything else. I mean, I grew up in a very diverse school called Northside High School in Fort Smith, Arkansas. It was about 80% black, uh, you know, 10% Hispanic, 10% white. So I, I grew up just, you know, knowing, that it, but I didn't see racism in there. Uh, I'm sure, you know, it probably existed. I'd be stupid if I said it didn't, but I never saw it. I mean, I had friends from all different walks of life, backgrounds. We played ball. We played, you know, we, we just hung out. That's that's what we did. And that's what we need to get back to is just hanging out with each other and learning uh, about different experiences and things, but not based on your skin color. But again, it goes back to your character. So absolutely. I think you did the right thing by pulling your daughter. I think uh, you you are absolutely right. hundred percent. The teacher knew what she was doing when she gave that assignment. Yeah. And, I mean, she's no kid. I mean, she's teaching AP English. They exactly know what they're doing right there. <laughs> 
so John, uh, I, I was in 10th district. I just got redistricted to 11th district. No, yeah. matter, <laughs> no matter what the redistricting happened, my traffic and transportation issues have not uh, eased just because I got registered. My home is still in the same spot. Uh, yep. So as a candidate, I, I guess my question is, I know for sure traffic and transportation are major concerns, not only for working mom like me, but for everyone living in 11th district. And uh, I know that a world-class transit system will encourage not only job creation, reduce congestion and pollution, but it also promotes Northern Virginia uh, opportunities in Northern Virginia. And uh, I've noticed that Jennifer Wexton keeps talking about transportation solutions. So she's been in the office for four years. I looked at her website left and right, trying to see if she has proposed any transportation solutions. And other than saying that I'm against tolls, which I think we all should be, I mean, yeah. Yeah, we've seen, we've seen, I don't right. see anything coming out of it. What, what do you think? Well, you know, they just passed the, uh, you know, the infrastructure bill, uh, you know, uh, late last year, uh, one point, yeah, one point two trillion dollars. Uh, but most of that wasn't infrastructure. Let's just be honest. Uh, but the the issues in Northern Virginia have been, uh, but they've been growing for the past 15, 20 years because as government gets bigger, and bigger and bigger, you're going to have all these other companies coming closer to that uh, to that central source. That's where their lobbying firms are. That's kind of how they do their contracts. Uh, and, and we're starting to run out of space. I mean, Prince William County is, uh, you know, we've been fighting for, for a long time against this thing called the Bi-County Parkway that's going to take up farmland uh, and what's called the Protected Rural Crescent where I live. Uh, data centers uh, and, and everything else, uh, you know, going up. Uh, you know, all under the guise that we're going to provide money for schools. Well, that, you know, we always get sold a bill of goods on that. But the transportation issues in the state are more, I think, of more of a state issue. Federal can help with, uh, you know, with the Department of Transportation and, and prioritizing what needs to be uh, done within each state. And then those states need to make sure that they have a great federal uh, relationship. Uh, and the member actually needs to be in the district. Jennifer Wexton is nowhere to be found in the district. Uh, you know, if I'm fortunate to be a member of Congress, I guarantee I will not be staying in D.C., uh, you know, all night, you know, had a whole, you know, hanging out at fundraisers or things. I'm going to be in the district. I'm going to be talking to people, real people, uh, not 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 party people, but people who actually do the job and make make each county work. Uh, and, and what what issues do they see uh, that I can help uh, alleviate uh, You know, when I do drive into Washington? And that's probably one of the benefits of being this close is you don't have to become part of the swamp. You can actually become part of the solution, not continue to be part of the problem. Yeah. And also, John, when you're talking about real people, I'm assuming your constituents, are, all, are you also relating it to like school board members, board of supervisors, and sure. uh, those people that actually know what is going on? Yep. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think those relationships are key. Uh, and when I started this campaign, uh, you know, that's one of the first things we did was talk to the various county board of supervisor members to kind of see what issues are they, what are the issues are they dealing with in their county? Uh, uh, and, and transportation was one of those big issues. Uh, land use was the second issue. Because uh, again, you know, we're going to start pushing Washington, Washington, D.C. further and further out. You know, the other thing we could do uh, is maybe look at, uh, you know, uh, relocating some of these big uh, bureaucratic institutions outside of DC and kind of spread them around the United States, still keep DC as the hub of government as per the constitution. But I think you can take some of these other uh, entities out uh, in less congested areas uh, and still, still provide a vibrant economy for Virginia. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. What about these tolls on 66 and tolls on Dallas Greenway? Do you agree with those? Tolls, or do you feel it's necessary evil? We have no choice to live. I, I don't agree with them. I mean, I think we pay. I mean, we're paying four and a half dollars for gas, five and a half for diesel. I think we're paying enough uh, for those, and those are again always sold under the guise that oh, this will pay for itself. Well, it only pays for itself because it comes out of your wallet, comes out of my wallet, comes out of our kids' wallet, comes at the expense of the consumer. Uh, and you see when when those tolls wind up getting congested, that dollar amount goes up and up and up and up and up, uh, sometimes 30, sometimes $40. Uh, and, and that's not what was that's not how it was presented to us uh, when it was sold to us uh, that this is a great idea. You know, I live out uh, in Noakesville, so I get on 66 right at Gainesville. And you see all the construction that they're doing 
because uh, they're bringing the tolls all the way out to, towards Haymarket. Uh, you know, under the guise, of, oh, we're going to we're going to solve traffic. Well, you're not really going to solve traffic when you're narrowing the number of lanes so you can have one express lane into DC. And how much is that going to cost? So no, I'm not a big toll person, uh, but we do have to find a way to uh, uh, to pay for uh, you know the transportation infrastructure that doesn't kill small business, that doesn't kill commuters, uh, and, and and there's got to be a better solution. Absolutely, John. Absolutely. I, I, I so wish that if you're elected member, you're going to focus on transportation. I think that's a, a pending issue that's just not been the focus. And uh, working moms like us, uh, I'm sure there are millions here, um, struggle. We struggle on a daily basis, trying to get our kids on time to basketball games. Just yeah. oh, get it to work. <laughs> yeah, and one accident. One accident costs you about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes you know, in traffic. And I think that's that the other part that's going to be key for a member of Congress is being able to work with, you know, Governor Yunkin and then whoever the new governor is going to be in Maryland, because, you know, this is still the DMV uh, and, and being able to say, hey, how do we partner up to make sure our constituents, uh, you know, can get to and from work, one, without, uh, you know, breaking the bank, two, make sure they're safe, uh, and three, that we're actually looking at the next uh, uh, the, the next potential issue on the transportation horizon. Hundred percent. I think partnering is a way to go because it not only affects us; we are all interrelated humans at this point. So, uh, John, let me take it back again to parental rights. I think we briefly touched on schools. Uh, I was meaning to ask you then. So, uh, I mean, uh, factually, I mean, as much as we've done very well with the Governor Youngkin's race, I still think 10th congressional districts, we have to be able to work with our independent partners and soft Democrats, right? I consider independent voters and soft Democrats as the most reasonable sect of Democratic Party, and I'm willing to work with them, and we have to, yeah. uh, in order to agree. Uh, but one thing that when I speak to, the reason I say I ran for an office in the past, and I'm always out there in Asian circles, especially in minority communities, immigrant communities, very reasonable people, very hardworking, their values align with us. But one thing that they continue to say, and I just really, uh, I don't think I eloquently debunked what they were trying to say, is that they keep saying Republicans are constantly making efforts to take away local control of school under the name of parental rights. You and I know that's not what we are about. So how yeah. do you think we can articulate and say, you know what, we are really not trying to take look take away local control, control of schools. Uh, we, are, we truly value parental rights. I think that the, the one thing I've been talking to people is we have to get the federal government out of states' rights issues and education is a state right issue. Uh, so we have to abolish the Department of Education, make sure that money goes back to the states. That way, that money's not closer to the states, but the people who elect their, their, their delegates or senators here in Virginia are closer to that as well. So there's more power at the local level than there's ever going to be at the, the, the federal level. Uh, so you know, getting rid of the Department of Education, I think, is going to be key uh, to that. Uh, the other is we have to make sure we have a parental bill of rights that lays out accountability, transparency, curriculum, where parents can be involved in their, their kids' education as they should. Uh, as the example I gave earlier, I was definitely uh, as well as my wife involved in our daughter's education and made sure that that you know she had choice. But you know uh, we were lucky enough to uh, be able to have afforded that. There's many families who can't do that, so we need to find you know whether it be tax credits or whether it be grants uh, that allow them that same opportunity uh, for their kids. Uh, we want to make sure there is local control, but that local control. Uh, also needs to give parents a voice at these school boards and they shouldn't be shut down as we've seen in Loudon, as we've seen in Prince William County, uh, and as we've seen in Fairfax, covering up sexual assaults and everything else. You know, there, there needs to be accountability, there needs to be transparency. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and what I like about the word transparency, it has the word parent in it, which means parents have a front row seat, bureaucrats sit in the back. And I will fight hard to make sure uh, that I'm a strong voice on the federal side for that parental bill of rights and for the uh, abolition of uh, the Department of Education, because they do nothing but use that as a bludgeon hammer, uh, where we have to grow administrative, uh, 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 an administrative state for all these schools just to comply with all these federal regulations. Get that out, get rid of the administrative state, give that money to teachers, allow them to teach.
Yeah, yeah. I, I think you, you are getting at something. I think department education could, should, even if it is not eliminated, at least it, the bureaucracy should be low and uh, the focus should be on real education. And yeah. just one, one other thing that I, I usually tell my own counterparts and my own fellows is that um, if um, uh, teachers and administrators want to focus on real education, like teaching math, science, arts, liberal arts, whatever the kid is interested, I am totally okay. I am not going to be out there fighting for my parental right. But when they start expanding their wings into other stuff is where I start demanding. Otherwise, I'm actually not a very demanding person. I sit back and let them do the job. Yep, I think we're all that way. Exactly, exactly. So John, what is it this, that I heard that you do listening tours? Is that um, uh, something that you kind of go around the campaigns and you listen to issues? What is that? Yeah, it, it's, uh, so we'll set up various campaign events and uh, invite people. And I, I don't give a stump speech. I say, what are your issues? I wanna hear from you. Because uh, what you have to say is a lot more important than what I have to say. Uh, so, so what, you know, where are you at in, 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 in your life, uh, where are you at, you know, with your family, your faith, uh, and it's basically just, just here in their hearts. And that's kind of, that's kind of where our, uh, our campaign slogan, believe again, uh, came about. So my wife and I, in early January, uh, we were, uh, at one of the first, first stops about two or three days after we, uh, declared our candidacy, my candidacy, uh, we're a great team, 34 years of marriage, she's a doll. Uh, but you know, people were kind of disheartened and like, you know, just down. And, uh, you know, we, I get in the truck, we start driving. I said, man, people just need to believe again, uh, you know, that, 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 that our rights get, come from God. Uh, they need to believe again that our country is still the greatest country in the world. Uh, and they need to believe in each other that together through unity, strength, and purpose, that we can make a difference together. And, uh, you know. Absolutely. Kind of emotional. Sorry. So uh, you know, Simeon says, that's our slogan. Yeah. We need yeah. No, amazing. We no, need thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Thank that's, you. Thank you for sharing that's that. the heart of this campaign. That has been the heart of this campaign. Um, oh, yeah. And it has been, it has been awesome because that's a unifying message. We've talked to a lot of Democrats uh, who, who are attracted to our campaign because of that. Uh, we're not bomb throwers. We're, we're problem solvers. Uh, we're solutions oriented. Uh, and, and, and we're willing to listen to what their issues are uh, without calling names and all the other stuff that you see on social media. And, and it's been refreshing uh, to many of them. And they said, man, if I can vote, if I can vote for you in the, in the primary, uh, uh, we would, because we're done with the Democrat Party. But we want to uh, find a Republican we can believe in uh, who, who, who stands on faith and family and freedom, uh, who's going to go to Washington, D.C. and do the right things for the right reason and not become part of the swamp. So, you know, that is the refreshing part of this whole campaign. It's been, it's been awesome. Awesome. That, no, that's a great story. And uh, it's kind of funny you mentioned our campaign. That's true. I mean, you can't do anything without your family support. I Thank mean, you. You, are, you are the friend face for your constituents, your family, but there is so yeah. much more that goes on behind the scenes. Yeah. So, yeah. John, you received actually great endorsements. Uh, I mean, Representative Ralph Norman, he's serving the South Carolina's fifth district. For those of you that doesn't know who Jim Bridenstine is, he's a former NSA administrator. Dave Brad, who is a former congressman and 25th United States National Security Advisor, General Michael Flynn. I mean, these are amazing endorsements. Did they resonate with your issues or did you know them personally? I mean, how did these endorsements come about? Um they resonated with what we've been saying. So, uh, you know, Jim Bridestein's a dear friend. Uh, when I was in legislative affairs, uh, he was still a member of Congress on the House Armed Services Committee, uh, but he was, you know, al always interested in space. So when Vice President Pence was leading the National Space Council, uh, those of us in what's called legislative affairs uh, would, would, take, would escort them to some of these events. So Jim and I actually got to know each other uh, when we flew down to uh, Cape Canaveral for one of the national security space events with Vice President Pence. So being able to, you know, talk with him, uh, even, you know, even, you know, he, he's a, he's a great man of faith. Uh, and, and, and that's how we got to know each other. And then he became NASA administrator. Uh, we still stayed in contact even after I retired. And then we wound up sitting on the same board together for a company called Voyager Space Holdings. Uh, that 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 builds an ecosystem, if you will, of space companies that are complementary. 
Uh, and then when I called and said, hey, Jim, uh, you know, feeling led to, 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 to run for office, uh, he goes, hey, man, that's awesome. And we spent three hours on the phone with that. Uh, and then, you know, he was friends with, with, with Dave Bratt. You know, Dave Bratt is down at Liberty. Uh, and, uh, he's the, the dean of their business school. Uh, our daughter is going to wind up going there in a couple of years. So we were down there for, uh, uh, camera remember what's called, uh, like an orientation, a pre-orientation, if you will, uh, you know, about a month and a half ago, was able to, to, to talk with Dave uh, on that. He said, yeah, you've been following the campaign, man. He said, he said this is great. Uh, he said, because uh, I was spent 40, to, uh, outspent 40 to 1 by Eric Cantor, and I won. Uh, because I had the message. He goes, you've got the message uh, as well on this. Uh, and then the endorsement, and that's when we got his endorsement. And then uh, Ralph Norman, same thing, a uh, good uh, uh, tied in with uh, his his military legislative affairs uh, officer uh, was uh, uh, a good friend of mine that we traveled together. And when he we found out I was running, he's like, hey, I got to get you with my boss, uh, uh, you know, Congressman Norman, because uh, you and him uh, gel on a lot of the same issues, uh, and, and I think it'd be a good conversation. So, yeah, so we talked, and yeah, he endorsed us right out of the gate. And then General Michael Flynn, uh, so my campaign manager, 26 uh, year Air Force veteran, served with another uh, Air Force veteran who was uh, General Michael Flynn's command chief when he was at Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, so he heard about us as well. And he lives in Ohio. He drove all the way from Ohio just to meet us. Wow. And say, hey, this campaign, there's something different about this campaign than, than, than what we've seen on the others. He said, you got to get with General Flynn. So we wound up driving to Ohio and we, we met, we had a great conversation, you know, and the endorsement came out and that's, that's, that's kind of how, how it happened. It didn't, didn't happen because we raised a lot of money. It, it happened because we actually have a message that wins, that resonates, that brings people together, that is a little different than what other campaigns are doing and even what they're going to do in the general. Yeah. John, that, that's pretty impressive. I always say when somebody is endorsing someone, they're putting their own personal credibility at risk. So if somebody can trust you, especially as accomplished as they are, they have surveyed the country, uh, they're endorsing you. Obviously, I think people have, ought to hear your message out for sure. And I'm glad you're doing this because this is going to resonate to some, quite a few of the audience as well. So, so John, I, 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 this is less of a question, more of a comment to um, comment. Uh, there is a guy uh, named Shadi Ayas. I'm not sure if you heard of him at all. He's a medical doctor from Percival that is running against um, Vexton in primaries. And he's challenging Vexton and he promises to tackle the opioid crisis, support public education and to advocate for peace. The reason I uh, brought, brought that um, issues up on him is because it's kind of funny to me when they say support public education, when they're completely ruining it, like 100% ruining it. And it also is very ironic in this D and age if they're talking about peace, um, because as Democrat party, it has become a party of war since they took in the office. What, yeah, what's, your take? Uh, what's your take about this guy, if you even heard of him? Well, I, I, think, uh, I think he dropped out. Uh, okay. uh, you know, on that. So he, I haven't heard higher hair from him since he went up other than saying, nope, Jennifer Weston is, okay. is who he's going to support. He just wanted to get his message out that we need, that Democrats need to focus on uh, uh, other policies. Okay. Uh, good morning for coming out talking about the opiate crisis, because, you know, last week there was a report on WTOP that said America surpassed 107,000 uh, drug overdoses, which is the most in history. Wow. So Joe, Biden record, Joe Biden's record with Wexton support is not one of those things that they probably want to uh, highlight. Uh, but if I'm lucky enough to, uh, to be the, the general candidate, then I, I will go after those because we've, uh, a lot of those come from the border. Uh, a lot of the ingredients come from China. It's bad enough, but you know, they unleashed COVID that killed a lot of our seniors. Now they're uh, shipping over drugs that are killing our youth. So it's us in the middle who have to stand up, stand strong, stand firm, and make sure the right policies are 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 are, are written, are passed, uh, so we can get our country back from these people. Elvis, so what a what a deadly strategy to destroy this great nation. I mean, you're using communist China, its money, its power to kind of uh, kill our seniors, as you said. Yep. And you're using these weak borders to kind of kill our youth by bringing in opiates. I mean, it's just a deadly combination. And uh, I feel sad, my heart aches for this great nation that I came in and I wanna continue to serve and be part of this nation. 
So, uh, John, along with me, there were uh, there uh, there are like tons of ethnic groups in your congressional district. I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure as a candidate, you would have dig deep into demographics. There are uh, 15 percentations. It's um, uh, the, about seven percent non-Hispanic and 29.4 um, percent of the household speak a different language other than English is not their first language. So, what's yes. your outreach? strategy because you need all of these you need them in primaries but you also need them in general as general yeah. so what is the strategy so uh, a couple of things uh, we have friends from all backgrounds uh, we have Vietnamese friends who uh, we served with a church uh, who's our kids were on junior bible quiz together uh, they're gonna be, they've got an outreach team for the general uh, I have a really good buddy of mine who's a retired colonel out of the army his wife's Puerto Rican and great, uh, great Spanish speaking, great, uh, just, just very level-headed uh, 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 woman of faith uh, who's gonna do the Hispanic uh, outreach. And then my wife and I were actually children's pastors uh, for two and a half years at Word of Life Assembly of God over in Springfield. So that's about 83 different nationalities that we're still tied into. So being able to leverage that experience uh, and, and, and their people and those people and their experience to be able to bring in to say, hey, look, we're we're going to be the most inclusive uh, because we share the same values. Uh, that's that's the strategy. And I think that's going to be a winning strategy. Uh, and we have some some great Muslim friends as well uh, who are going to come uh, uh, beside us in the general. We'll do a lot of outreach in, in Ashburn uh, and, and go into these communities because what Republicans have not done in the past is go into these communities and talk to these people. Because all they see is Democrats knocking on their doors saying Republicans are bad, Republicans are bad, and without ever, ever, you know, meeting us. So I want them to meet us. I want them to have a, you know, I want to have a dialogue and a conversation with them. I want to know what their issues are, because I guarantee they're going to line up with what we in the Republican Party and the conservative movement agree with. And that's faith, that's family, and that's freedom. Uh, and, that, and that's making sure that we're doing what we need to do. Uh, to, uh, for the outreach on those. So that's that's kind of the, the grand strategy uh, of what we're going to use going forward. It's going to be a you know, multi-ethnicity, multi-pronged ap uh, approach, and it's going to be built on honesty, integrity, and engagement. John, I'm glad you, you said about Democrats. Democrats, we let Democrats dictate yep. the narrative. They yep. went door, knocking the doors, they go to citizenship trainings, they go to immigration forums and say that Republicans are bad. Uh, we should have dictated our own narrative versus let them dictate us. And I'm glad, I mean, I always say in order to solve the problem, we need to acknowledge the problem and candidates such as you are coming out and acknowledging the problem. That's a big step. Uh, in order to in order for us to come across as um, inclusive and embrace uh, embracing because we are we are those people we yeah. don't have to pretend yeah. we are those people yeah. so John along the same lines again you're running against strong opponents like folks that were in school board a couple of your opponents were in council members they were board of supervisors so what, what if our viewers are watching you and I'm going to share this video in multiple forums. What, what sets you apart from them and why do you think you will drive a, a victory in general? I mean, why should they let go of um, people that have already uh, won before in some form of races and choose you over them? Well, one, I know this is a calling I have uh, to step forward and make a difference. So it's not just me, it's, you know, it, 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 it's God uh, as well. I know he's, you know, directed our steps. He's, you know, uh, being able to bring us to, uh, to you know, engage with, with people that we never would have met uh, had we not taken this journey. Uh, but if you look at across the candidates, no other candidate has congressional experience. I have five years of congressional experience. I already have great friends on the Hill, on the Freedom Caucus, uh, you know, the, the, the Jim Jordan side of uh, Freedom Caucus, Scott Perry, uh, that's what Ralph Norman is. Uh, he's current Freedom Caucus, Jim Bridenstine, Dave Bratt, former Freedom Caucus. Uh, and then, you know, we also have uh, good friends on uh, the Senate side as well. Uh, we have good friends within the uh, professional staff. So if you want a candidate who's, who's accomplished, again, I helped draft legis legislation that created the United States Space Force. I know how to do it. I know how to uh, work in a pragmatic way. That had to be a bipartisan. So being able to sit down and have those conversations with Republicans and Democrats on, hey, here's how we get to a solution. Here's the threat. Here's the legislative proposal. And then it gets passed. Uh, and we have the you know, United States Space Force now. 
uh, and a couple other uh, entities. One's the Space Rapid Capabilities Office that builds classified uh, space capabilities for the nation. Uh, so if you want someone who's ready to go in day one, uh, someone who's not going to be bought, someone who's not going to be compromised. I had my career. I don't need another career. I'm only stepping forward because of what we've seen over the past year. It's time for leaders, not politicians. Uh, and I know that uh, you know my wife and my, my family will hold me accountable. And I know the constituency will hold me accountable, as they should, uh, if I ever backtrack, which I won't backtrack. Uh, my word is my bond. Uh, integrity, excellent service. Those things have been traits uh, that have been... Uh, you know, invested in me by 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 many leaders over a 28-year Air Force career. And I'm not going up to Congress to be part of them. I'm going up there to hopefully make a difference uh, for for men and women and children here in the 10th District, and more importantly, the United States of America. That's why I'm stepping up. That's why you should vote for me uh, on on September on excuse me Saturday, May 21st, uh, so that we can start this general uh, and, and and go after Jennifer Wexton for all her votes. No one has the depth of expertise that I have on all the issues that she's voted on. I've been involved across the board, uh, and and that's kind of that's kind of where we're going to go. Hey, uh, John, I think I'm glad you kind of were able to differentiate and articulate why people should vote for you, regardless of who is on the ballot at this point. So, uh, John, I know you have another engagement at seven. We are coming to the end of the show. Um, I think our audience very much understand the kitchen table issues. Uh, they understand the meaning of your slogan. They understand the sentiment that came along with the slogan. Uh, I'm sure they're very pleased with the incredible people that endorsed you. So in the last minute or two, tell our audience if I missed asking you anything. I try to cover the issues. I want to portray to our constituents of uh, what issues you're taking on and why you will be the right candidate for Wexton. But if I missed anything, take a minute and talk that through to our audience. Well, I think, uh, you know, as we've seen, uh, you know, right before the 2020 election, uh, we saw the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop. So uh, being able to uh, get into me as a member of Congress, being able to reform Section 230, which gave uh, carte blanche authority uh, or immunity to uh, big tech companies uh, to allow them to do what they're doing now. Now, that was passed in 1996 under the Communication Decency Act. I want to reform that Section 230 to where uh, th these big tech companies can be held accountable. They can be held liable. They can get sued. Right now, they have full immunity. Uh, so that they stay out of our elections. Uh, then I also want to look at, uh, you know, uh, election integrity. Uh, you know, the 2000 mules uh, issue, uh, you know, Molly Hemingway wrote a book called Rigged. Uh, I think that needs to be looked into to see what happened. Those, you know, especially on those video surveillance cameras that were, you know, they're owned by the state. They weren't just placed there by, by someone trying to do a documentary. So we need to find out what happened uh, in the 2020 election so that it doesn't happen again. If there was fraud, if there was something else, uh, I think there was fraud, but but it doesn't matter what I think, it's what I can prove. And I think we need an independent commission to be able to look at those things uh, so that it doesn't become a systemic issue that Democrats are going to continue to exploit because Republicans were too weak to, to address it. So we've got to take that head on. Uh, and then we have to make sure the border is secured, uh, which means if that means blocking funding for certain, uh, certain aspects of, of the Department of Homeland Security until that border is secure, if that means getting uh, holding, you know, Mayorkas, uh, accountable for his lack of uh, action and his violation of his oath of office, which which could lead to impeachment for him and removal, then I'm all for that because we should not have as many issues uh, at the border as we've had for the past 1.5 uh, yeah 1.5 months or one year five months uh, now. Uh, it's got to be fixed. It's going to take leadership, uh, and 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 I promise you that uh, I will take that on. John, thank you so much. I, I'm glad I gave you that one minute because you were able to talk about so many more issues that I personally care about. Election integrity is a big deal for me. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad you kind of caught up on that. Uh, 2000 Mules was uh, an eye opener, especially with regards to geo tracking issues. Right. That always thought but which is so so true so i thank you for joining us uh, you have another engagement i know this is a very tight schedule i i thank you for taking the time to come on the show it's a lot of commitment and um, last but not the least i do want to thank you for serving our nation and thank i look you. forward to your leadership um, uh, if you win in primaries I, I look forward to your leadership in congress and uh, otherwise, I look forward to your leadership in just whatever form that you're able to, because you have so many, so much of skill set that you can continue to ut utilize. Appreciate so, it. Thanks for having me. 
thank you. This was a wonderful conversation, viewer. I wish uh, John Henley the very best in primaries. John, if you are the chosen candidate, hope you come by. So again, one more time so we can get deep into some of the issues that are placed in our country and especially Jennifer Wexton's policies. I want to like dissect and let candidates articulate and say why they're bad for our nation. So I hope you come by once you win your primaries. Oh, absolutely. And even if I don't win the primary, you know, we're going to back who up, whatever the candidate is, and we're going to make them the strongest candidates to go against Jennifer Wexton. Because at the end of the day, this is bigger than one candidate. This is about the United States of America, and we have to get it back. I love the spirit. I love this. That's what patriots do, and that's what God-loving people do. So, viewers, this Saturday, May 21st, is the day that John Henley will be on the ballot for primary. So, if you are in 10th Congressional District, or if you, even if you're not, please let your friends in 10th Congressional. It's a large co the Congressional District, so I'm sure each one of us have about 10 people that we know. Please ask them to listen to these conversations that count. Support John Henley if they agree with his policies, and then hope to see you at those locations. Also, on May 21st, I run an immigration and minority coalitions at Fairfax GOP headquarters. Uh, we have those meetings to ensure that we're strategizing our engagement. So if you are one of those minority and engagement uh, interested person, please do come in and uh, or just me Facebook message me and tell that you want to come in and I'll send you all the details. Last but not the least, on at 7 p.m. on Conversations That Count on Saturday, I will have Stephen Sutton. St uh, Stephen is a senior vice president of Leadership Institute. We're going to talk to him as well. Have a wonderful evening. Have a great evening. God bless John Henley and his family. I know his wife is working as a team very, very hard, thanks to his kids, two children that are serving our nation as well. God bless your family, Mr. Henley, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.